Let's try this. Give it a minute or two. Thank you. Yeah, it was really weird. I can even see the background is a little junky. I haven't used that scene before with the chatting, so I wonder if I just had too many resources running on one time. Right now I'm using two different PCs, my Mac for primary development, and then a Windows laptop that's doing the actual streaming part. When I was streaming from both of the PCs, it was really bad. It was actually the first time I seen that. So I gotta take a look at that particular scene to see what's up with it. So, uh, for those of you that are new, which right now is just Brady. Yeah, it sucks. The fan on my other PC is going crazy. I actually wrote a couple of blog posts about the streaming configuration. I really want to buy a new PC. I just have to get the wife to approve the purchase. I found a PC that I want to use directly just for the streaming portion of it, which is far better CPU and everything. I don't know if it's just your machine, but I know there's indicators in OBS that tell you whether or not you're dropping frames. And I started dropping frames when you said there were issues. So with this, we are going to, what I've been working on, Brady and anyone else that's watching this video is starting out with a basic application, uh, essentially file new. Uh, and it's a contacts manager application. So what we've been trying to do is show how we build an app from the very beginning all the way to deployment. And we've been following along or people that have been watching have been following along on this Git repo that I'll post in the Teams chat. Again, there is an outline page that kind of shows step by step. And I've included videos and the source links. Everything's been put up to GitHub. We started out with an introduction to three IDEs, Visual Studio, Visual Studio Code, and JetBrains Writer. I've been pretty much using JetBrains Writer for the whole time, but wanted to share the love. Uh, we then started working with the model development, went through building out the management layer, built out the data layer, added some unit tests, then added what I call poor person's dependency injection, because at this point we we're just doing unit tests. Then we introduced mocks, and then uh, we broke out the data layer into its own separate repository with its own separate objects so that later on in a future one, probably next week, we will go and separate out the data store. So the database could be right now it's SQLite running locally on my machine, but when we push it live to Azure in the next day or so, we'll probably switch it over to a SQL server or maybe a document database like Cosmo or something like that. We ultimately built out the API, very rudimentary, the ability to get, set, save, delete contacts, and then we double check that it all worked. So I'm gonna go through high level the app today. We're gonna to focus on wrapping up the rest of the API and then maybe put some Postman test around it. We also worked on documenting the API. So enough of me talking, let's look at some code. So this is a sample of the project broken out into multiple different layers. We all start off with the logic layer, commonly referred to as business layer, manager layer, service layer. The contact manager has one or more properties all revolving around the contacts. So the ability to get contacts, save contacts, search for contacts, etc. We have a shared repository of data objects 
which right now just have the basic contact information with a phone number and an address and then interfaces for the repository and the data stores that we are injecting. Our data project has the contact repository to it that lists all the methods essentially to access the repository. And then this in turn is using a data store which is written in SQL Lite or uses a SQL Lite database. So in a future episode or future stream, we're gonna take this out and replace it with like a SQL Server backend or DynamoDB. But we've already built the application in a way that allows us to go and change that. We also have unit tests for the project that cover 100% of the code in the logic and most of the domain layer. We then spent the last two, three episodes building out the API, which I'm more than happy to take any advice from you, Brady, on it. But the idea for it is we have this API. I added Swagger documentation to it. Uh, we have some sample test cases that we can call, which I'll show here in the context sample request. We publish the API documentation using a Swagger package. So if we go to our startup, I added some Swagger documentation for it. Next step for us is going to probably tomorrow build out the Azure infrastructure for this. I'm not sure if we're gonna use Terraform or not and then build a deployment pipeline that will take this code from Git and automatically publish it to Azure. And then now that it's in the cloud, what we want to do, <laughs> and then, thank you. And then the next thing we're going to do now that it's published in the cloud, we might not want it exposed to the world. We're going to try to mess around with uh, Azure authentication with it, probably using uh, the B2B connections in Azure to do it. Something I've never done before, so I'm going to play around with it probably tomorrow or Thursday on the stream. But we got it all working hunky dory. If I run the project, it'll pull up the API docs. Uh, if we take a look and just open up a new tab and do local, it's not contacts, contacts, and I think I added a uh, swagger dash UI to it. Now, uh, what was the endpoint? Six days away from it, and I already forgot what the endpoint name was. Or is it just context swagger UI? What is the name of it? Come on. Oh, there it goes. Swagger. So we have a fully fledged quote unquote swagger API. I added most of the properties. I didn't go through with the license in terms of agreement, just basics. Each of the endpoints has the documentation for it. Um, I added code comments and everything to fully qualify and explain what's happening as well as all the HTTP responses. My ultimate goal is this project itself and the videos can be a real good starting guide for someone that hasn't done anything and uh, does more than just, you know, double click hello world. And then each of the contact, each of the models has some documentation which fields nullable any ranges, whether they're uh, date times or if they're email addresses, that kind of stuff. 
So we did most of that and we can use it through contacts. If I you know, do try it out, I can hit execute and run and get a list of all the contacts, which is mostly pretty much me because I've been just adding my name to it. And one of the cool things with, uh, with Writer is it has this ability to do uh, scratch files where you can add in, they have lots of different scratch files, APIs. Uh, you can do a scratch file for uh, Amazon Redshift, JavaScript files, ASP. These are essentially files that you can just throw in to do whatever you want. So I created a scratch file around the API. So within Writer, you can just hit and run the request and it will spit back out all the data plus saves it locally this is the equivalent of running if you're in visual studio code the http request extension that is super popular now i just do it straight through here so everything's right within the ide and then i can add environment files I find this a, a great mix of what Postman is, but just inside the environment. So we have sample posts to try out everything, deleting contacts, searching for contacts, uh, adding contacts like this one will generate a failed request. This one will generate a good request, etc. So that's the API and I forgot to mute my cell phone. Let me mute the cell phone. And again, Brady, if you have any, any suggestions for the API, by all means, let me know. It's fully functional as far as I know. It's not massively complex. What I wanted to do today was to get the dependency injection wired up totally. Right now, if you look at the test cases, right now we are doing all, oh, it's actually not here. It's in the console app. Console app is what we're using originally to do the trial and error. And here's the setup. So we're doing what I call poor man's dependency injection. And we're doing something similar in the API right now. And I want to go and change that to use the regular so if we look at our actual controller with the uh, with the contacts controller you'll see every method does this and let me increase this font a little bit in case it comes across as low I was doing some work on it this weekend and I changed the font because it was way too small for me. Why did that go to 40? It should only be 14. And then you should be 16. Make it a little bit easier on the eyes when you're looking at this. So here is where we want to introduce the dependency injection and get rid of all the hard coding that we have here in all our API endpoints and in our SQLite inside the context we have this on configuring that hard codes the value to our data source so let's get started with that first thing we want to do is open up our startup and we are going to introduce it to I believe we start off with the services and then configure but when all else fails since you don't do it every day I'm going to go to the entity framework guide and look at dependency injection asp.net because I don't remember it off the top of my head. And here it is, dependency injection ASP core. 
So the first thing you want to do with the quote unquote real dependency injection is build out your list of dependencies, which we already did because we created interfaces for all of them. But we have to tell the ASP.NOR or framework what we want to do with them. So what types of models do you want to do? So essentially here, the highlighted code, it says if someone wants a type of I logger, return back this class of logger. And there's lots of different scopes that you can do things or add things. For us, we want to add, if we look back at our repository or our uh, controller, we want to add a contact manager, a contact repository, and a SQLite data store. So I am just going to copy this out for now. And it looks like it's configure services. Let's go to our startup and configure services, which should be up here. Typically, you want to do it after the controllers. We already got the swagger stuff there. So let's go here. And you'll see that there are three different types scoped transient and singleton this really depends on the type of operation that you want and i never ever remember which one is the best one to choose i can tell you that singleton ensures that there is one instance created for your class. So this is typically done for logging. Scoped is usually scoped to the current login section and then transient, I forget what it is. But the great news is you can come here and look at service lifetimes. And this has a really good express or a really good explanation. Transient services are probably the best. This is uh, when you're using um, ones that are stateless, that are stateless between requests. So most um, most services have to deal or are best used for transient scoped are towards the client request. So this is typically when you want to do things like user authentication. Singleton is you want to is you want to make sure that there's only one class shared across all instances of your code. For the most part, you don't want to use Singleton uh, because it gets very messy and, and challenging to work with. But I said for the most part, there's always exceptions. So we're going to add transients to all of ours unless the any framework documentation tells us otherwise. So I'm going to just comment these out for a second and then go through and do services dot add transient and then use the overload for that. And we want to say anytime there is a request for I contact manager i think that's what i called it right what did i call it oh i did not create an interface for that what i did huh so we can't scope out that one come back and do that in a minute let me go and let's take care of the contact context and the or sorry, the SQLite and the data, since those are the hardest ones to do. So we want the eye contact data store. For this one, I think we are just going to say, when you see this, I want you to use the SQL light data store. What do I call it? SQL light, yeah, SQL light data store. And then services dot transient whenever we want an eye contact 
repository, we are going to replace it with a contact, what do I call it? Probably should do the research beforehand. Uh, where are you? Controller, controller, controller. There you go, contacts controller. Contact repository, simple enough. I should have thought of that. Uh, where are we? Start up now. I got too many windows. I'm gonna close all these windows now. I got way too many open. And where are we? Start up. And this we want to replace with a contact up, 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 our repository. So this is the first step. Now that we have these two registered, ooh, I got a new follower. Holy cow. And I see you. I see that. Is it Nuzvipa? Follow it along. Thank you for the follow. It's the first time it actually went off live during a stream. Yes, I can see you. We'll cover the websites probably in the next couple of days. Right now we're using JetBrains Writer to uh, talk about or to work with our application. Right now we're trying to add in dependency injection to our to our application so that we don't have a lot of repeated code like we do here. So I think that's all the registration that's needed for it. So if we look here, that's pretty much it. So now it knows about it. And now whenever someone says, I want to I contact data store, it's going to go and new up an instance for that if it already doesn't have one and specify it. So let's see how we do that. Now, if we look here, the very beginning, we have the class with the controller, but we have no constructor for it. If we look back at our SQL data, or sorry, our data contact repository, we added an overload, or we added a parameter to our constructor to say, give me the data store you want to use. So now we have to do that with our controller, tell it the two data stores that we want to use. So let's go and do that and add a controller or a constructor to it. So we do contacts controller and then all you have to do is say you want an I contact repository and then we are going to call this contact repository and then an I contact data store and call this data store. Now it's gonna complain, oh, I don't want those to have underscores. Yeah. But we are gonna create two properties um, for these. So let's do a private read only. Uh, and this is going to be of type I contact data store. We are going to call it contact data store. And then a private read only I contact repository. And then call it underscore contact repository. Now in here, we pretty much just set those contact repository equals contact repository and then contact data store equals contact data store. So now if we start the app and I'm just going to put a console dot right line here for us to debug it just to see 
when we instantiate this, we should see these two values. So I'm going to put a breakpoint here and then stop this. And we are going to launch, relaunch the API with debugging enable. Singleton lose forever. Brady says singleton lose forever. Transient is that request. I think that's right. No, transient is for each creation scope per request. And it backwards. Okay, good. So I was right. So now we started here. We can see our contact controller. We actually have an eye contact repository, which is of type context.data.contact repository and it was already smart enough to put our connections in there so we're good so far we got our data and we're ready to go we still have to we still have to relaunch oops don't worry about that i just hit play we still have to go and clean this up but before we clean this up I want to clean this part up. So what we can do now is take out all this and this can just be an eye contact repository being passed in and we can do that all throughout. So I'm just going to do a little search and replace here. So I think that's control shift F. Yes, that's fine, but how do I replace? I always forget the shortcuts for it. And that's not active right now because this screen is active. So I got to go here, find and replace. Ah, it's Control H. That's what I thought it was. So we are going to want to replace this with underscore what I call a contact repository, I believe. Yeah, underscore contact repository. And then replace them all. So now it's a little bit cleaner. We're not newing up every single time we have a request, but we're still newing up the contact manager. So we have to fix this method for it. So the way to fix it is to go by or go back and create an interface for it because the only way that dependency injection works is by knowing an interface for it. And I'm actually surprised I didn't create an interface for this originally. I thought I did, but we will go and create one now. Good thing about it is with Visual Studio as well as uh, JetBrains Writer, you can create an interface for it. Also pass in an I logger into the constructor and use. Well, yes, you are correct. I haven't introduced logging yet. That was going to be uh, in the next episode or two, but I was just using console dot right line to set a breakpoint really for it. I'm not actually planning on logging to it. Hey, <laughs> no problem, Brady. This is something that I was going, I plan on doing. I, uh, I will inject the logger once we start introducing logging to it. Uh, for a lot of case, I've been doing step-by-step -step using the debugger to show where everything is because that's the way I learn the most. So now we need to take this and create an interface for it so we can inject it. Great news is both uh, Visual Studio as well as Writer, and I think Visual Studio Code has this, the ability to go and generate an interface for that. So I'm going to click on the little hammer here and do generate code which where'd it go it's not there where is it create a derived type create navigate refactor this 
Ah, there it is. Refactor this extract interface. So it's going to want to know where you want to put it, and what you're going to do with it, and what members. I am going to select all the members because we want all these to be part of it. And then where do I want it? Right now, we are just going to create it in its own file. Hit next, and it generated the interface for me. So now, and it also assigned the interface. So now I want to move this. So we're going to move this to another namespace. And then this should go to contacts dot domain dot interfaces interfaces ah move the domain but didn't move the file so let's do the next one which is pa -pa -ra -pa -pa -pa. Interface, refactor this. Ah, there it is. Move types matching files and move types to matching files in solution. So I think that was smart enough to add it to. Nope, didn't add it to where I wanted to. I wanted to put it here. There's an easy shortcut for it, but. Didn't figure it out right away. So let's take this out and move it to the right interface. So now we should be good. Our contact manager should inherit from that. It inherits from the interface. Now we can properly inject it. So let's go to our startup and add services. Dot add transient and say whenever we get a contact manager, replace it with a I contact or no, nope, replace it with a contact manager. So now if we go to our contacts controller. All I need to do is add it in here, do I contact manager, and then add a property here, private read only, I contact manager. And then establish it here. I call it, oh, I didn't give it a name. Contact manager. And then here, contact manager. Now, what I can do is get rid of this, this line here, and just do underscore contact manager. Since ASP.NET Core is going to give us that off the bat and i don't believe i really need the data store in here because it gets injected here but we'll get rid of that in a second and this uh delete this line turn this into an underscore turn this into an underscore Uh, turn this into an underscore, delete this line, and then turn this into an underscore, and delete it. Now if we run our app, it should be fully functional as it was before. So let's restart it. Brady, have you done any streaming yet? I haven't noticed anything on Twitter for you.
Or did you really uh, walk away? Ah, oh, okay. I'm terrible at it too. It's it's really a uh, it's really an art form that you pick up just like coding. You're really raw at the very beginning, but you just get better at it. You watch others stream is what I've been doing for the last month. What I need to do. Uh, what I really need to figure out next is the overall uh, configuration for being able to chat. So right now I have to turn my head away from the camera to chat with you or see if anything's chat. I have a separate monitor. I want to figure out a way to get it all working. But for now, this is really the best bet. At it. And you figure it out. Like you see, I started earlier today and then I had to go and read back. Yeah, I don't have to physically tap it. I still have to turn my head to look and see what you're saying unless I have a it pull up on another screen. So here we have API is working now uh, with it being injected. And here I can actually get rid of these two overloads now because I'm not using them anymore uh, because the way the dependency injection was set up back in our startup it's smart enough to know, okay, eye contact manager needed an eye contact repository, which needed an eye contact data store. So it kind of filled in all those blanks for us. And now our contact controller just has the one thing we really care about for now, Brady. Uh, in the future, we will add in an eye logger and get logging set up so that we can log to things like application insights or uh, database. But for now, we're not gonna add in logging. So now we cleaned up our API. Let's see what else was on the GitHub checklist here. We, so we took care of that. So I can add this bookmark to today's episode and I'll clean that up <clears throat> excuse me in a little bit what else do we need to oh the other thing we wanted to add or I wanted to add was to take our controller actually I do have a separate camera there that's a good idea Brady forgot this laptop has a built-in camera. I just don't have it enabled and I can flip back there. That's a good idea. Well, I'm going to take that note down. Set up second camera for chat. Cool. Oh, guess I know what I'm doing tonight. Configuring that to try it out. Yeah, I never thought of that because you really never see Fritz walking away. A lot of my original configuration was based on his blog posts, like the microphone I'm using, this backdrop behind that you can't see because it's blacked out, and a couple other things. But like I said, it's something you learn over time. He's been doing it for seven, eight months now. So I'm only in my second month of doing it. So I learn out things and as I learn them out, I tweet them or update the four or five blog posts I have on it. So let's take a look at our response to make sure we're getting all the properties. So we see here, if we do a request for me at least the 17th version of my contact the addresses and phone numbers are null we never really tried that out to see if it worked so let's go and take a look at that I believe the database model is there for it we have contacts we have address types we have address we got to worry about adding them now so Let's take a look, see if our API really works as intended. Uh, when I did the initial test, or if we look here, our 
add only had the basic information. So let's go and add a new contact with extra data to it. So I am going to copy this here as a starting point. Save a valid contact with address and phone number. And then give it a shot. All right, Brady, I'm going to put you on the spot now. I won't leave your middle name as Anne, though. It will be Lewis. I honestly don't know what his middle name is. And then his email address will still be do not mail. And then let's go and add in a phone number. So I think it's phones. And then this is an array of phone numbers, which has a, oh, how do I handle the array? I forgot. Phones, lowercase, well, I could do uppercase, so that shouldn't matter. And then this syntax, this. And then what does a phone have? Where's my models? A phone has phone number, extension, and phone type. I believe I made phone type required, but let's double check. Where'd you go? Phone number. And Brady will be at 8675309. Only the older people in the room will get that one. And then does he, what was the other one? Extension, I already forgot. I just literally looked at it. Extension and phone type. So he doesn't have an extension. So I will just leave that as no. And then I'm not sure if it'll work without the phone type because I haven't added any phone types. Well, the way it's checked is I can just run this and see what it returns back. And I got a 201. So let's go and take a look back. Brady, you notice I used the created at to provide the HTTP header so I can easily go and look at the contact details. Ah, it was created, but it didn't save. Good. So that's a problem for us to fix. So Brady was created here with no birthday, no anniversary. Sorry. <laughs> Could call you January. Oh, Daryl, what's up? How you doing? I haven't seen you here yet. You got some serious ASP.NET uh, people here. Pressure is on. Uh, so let's go back and figure out how to add that. What did I miss in the manager? We didn't do it in any of our tests and we really just mocked it out. So let's figure out how to get the phones added or mostly all the dependencies, including address two. So let's go take a look at our contact manager first. It's the root of all evil. And let's go to our save contact. So we do our validation, make sure it's there. So none of the validation rules should be there, but the save contact uh, is called. So let's go. And the first thing to do is make sure it's actually populated. So let's go and do that. Going to debug the API and make sure that our that uh, ASP.NET Core was able to take it and get our API response back. So let's go here for contacts and rerun Brady. Uh, since you guys weren't here in the very beginning, ha, yes, there is swagger in there. I will show you in a minute. Uh, there's no unique names, checks, or anything on the database right now, so I can add in multiple, as you see with my multiples. 
Uh, so let's take a look at our contact. And it has no addresses, which is fine because I had an entity. And it has phone numbers. Uh, so it should have added 8675309. So let's go take a look as to why not. So I'm going to do something called step into, which I believe is this, this one. Nope. That one. Yeah, that one. The icons are a little bit different depending on the environment. I normally just press the keystroke of F11 for it, but let's go into the next one. So we're going to step in, obviously the save contact in our repository just calls the data stores version of it. So here we are going to look at the contact. Now the contact object itself came in as a domain model which has all the phone numbers on it so that's good so far now i'm gonna step over line by line and check to see if maybe there's something wrong with our mapping so now we have a db connect and this represents the data model that's in our backend repository let's go and see what the DB contact looks like. So it has the birthday, the email, first name, last name, and it has the phone. So it's successfully able to add the phones. Let's go and see why it wasn't saved, even though it said it was saved. So next step is step over, step over. It was saved. Let's go back and look at the full contact. It still has the phone number, so let's go and check the database now. Phones, and I'm going to look at this. It has the phone numbers in there so it was saved successfully so each occurrence of it had it we have brady's id so if i just continue running the code the database is right and any framework is right so there's a problem with our code base and i believe i know what the problem is so right now, if we are doing a get with it, let me just minimize this. And look at the get contact. We are going to return a contact. And if I navigate to that function 12, and then yes, that's the contact repository. Ultimately, we're going to end up here at the data store where we call get contact and get contact or are you right here does it fine but if we break point here which we already have a breakpoint set up and i uh, i think we're still in debug we're still in debug let's go and get that reference to brady's Thing. So number 37 was the last one we saved. If we look here, this DB contact should only be populated with the primary table or the table that we are doing. We didn't tell any framework to go out and get any of the dependencies which is why they're turning up as null. Now there's lots of different ways you can do this. I think with our resident expert here, probably say that you can return it back as well as some additional headers to have what are called, I think reference links, I could be wrong, but saying, hey, if you want to get all the associated addresses, follow along with this path. So 
If we looked at the database, which is somewhere here, where you go, phones, not, not phones. Now let's go back to the database. If we go here, we can change our API to do, to have an extra endpoint to get us the, right now we go contact slash whatever number, we can go contact slash whatever ID slash phones and return a list of all the phones. If we want to return all the phone numbers and everything related to that contact in there, we would have to change the data store to return all of these back. Now there's, without getting into an API purist thing, yes. That was just what I was about to say, Brady. One needs to use caution when returning them all. The other is to create a service model. It's not the same as your data models. Yes. So that is what Brady is saying is we have to be careful to return everything. So one way we can go about doing it is to say, include everything in this model so that everything is returned back. And typically we don't want necessarily the user interface layer to match what the data layer sets up, which is why we created separate models in both the data store and the actual application model. Because at some point we tend, we are going to make them different just to show the point that Brady pointed out there that we want to keep it separate. The other thing to do, which is a common way to avoid that is one, you maybe I don't really care about uh, knowing Brady's phone number and or the multiple addresses he has, but I only really care. I need his email address because I want to send him something. So I don't need to traverse through his entire object graph of data. So I only wanted to see this. The way the API is currently designed for contacts, that makes sense. Another way of doing it is that we can create a separate product endpoint or when we return uh, back for this, we can return what are called, what's the term I'm looking for, Brady, that you put at the bottom of this request to show like the other follow through endpoints. So like back here, when we show this, I'm just gonna add this to the bottom of this file. We'll delete it afterwards. You can do something like a C also, but it's not called C also, which will say phones. And then that can give us the contact slash 37 with phones or just return a list of all the phone number identifiers for this and then contact slash 37 slash addresses slash one assuming we added an address for it. endpoint reference hypermedia that was it i think that's what i'm talking about is hypermedia where at the end of this response, we can provide a list of all the second points. Either case, I am not returning anything right now, so you have no way of getting to that. So the next approach would be for us to add an endpoint that would allow us to get all of the phone numbers and or addresses for it. Uh, in the meantime, I can go against popular uh, popular theory and just go and add that to our data store by doing a dot uh, include here. So I can do a dot include c colon c dot 
addresses and then dot include hmm. we'll take a look at that in a second Dara that was saying you can add links to your open API description to relate one operation to another not sure if swash buckle supports it though oh, take a look afterwards meantime I'm just gonna add this and then we can go back and look at it so this is a way we can add in our dependencies and any framework core will load them uh, but you notice our find changes so this we will just modify this to where c slash c dot contact id equals contact id now if we stop and rerun this we should see everything but like brady was mentioning this adds a lot of extra overhead and could get some recursion so we have to go all the way down to 37 ah it didn't work why didn't it work just the latest version of it let me close over all these other instances and stop this and I'm going to put a breakpoint here to make sure that our DB contact returned it. Let's go into debug mode. Oh, I did it for the get individual contact. That's why. So I got to do get contact 37. I didn't do it to the get contacts. Missing, oh, this is good. So I, I have a bad mapping in my endpoint. So this has to do with the mapping configuration, not anything to do with the actual code. So somewhere in here, it doesn't know how to handle the addresses and the phone numbers so let's take a look at our contact profile which i thought we took care of address address type yeah we took care of them interesting wonder why it broke so let's break point here and see what would oh you know what probably it is is this returned a queryable? So once it comes into here, it doesn't know what to do with it, I bet. Uh, DB contact, because I added the where clause at the end of it. When I added the where clause, it changed the type of variable and the mapper doesn't know what to do with it see it comes back as i queryable if i do when i did just the find which doesn't work i can do first or default and then c c dot contact id equals contact id now this should return a contact. Which is why it wasn't working before. So let's stop and restart. And view number 37. There it goes. So now we have it. 
Uh, I've seen a lot of places where you can do something like, you know, we'll probably add this at the next step. I don't know how detailed we want to get in the API before we release it. In a bell ring in, need to bounce, but I'll be turning, tuning in. Thank you, Brady. Uh, I tried different times. I'm going to try a different time because this time is really hard for a lot of people. So I might be doing it later in the day. Ironically, I started earlier on this and I had those machine issues. Otherwise, I would have started and avoided dinner time. This, this is, as soon as I'm done, I start making dinner for the family too. Uh, so we'll look into doing the rest of the phone probably tomorrow. But Daryl, if you're still on, do a quick show through of what we set up as an example. And if you want to follow along, you can take a look at the repo, which is listed here. And if you go to the contacts repo, look in the outline that MD file kind of walk through everything in the last episode, which you can see the video on. We added swagger to it, and you can actually get to the code base. And this example here goes through the actual MSDN or uh, MSDN Microsoft Docs post that we did. But the code base. We oh, let's get rid of this before I forget the code base. We started with the swagger docs here, listed the API URL for it. I didn't put in a real URL and then contact information for it. And then inside of our controllers, if you haven't noticed, I went and added uh, description text, what it returns all the different valid uh, API response codes to it. I didn't add any of the hyper media links to it that I'll try to figure out. But the idea was, I think, I'm not sure when you added, but start with an application from very beginning to finish. And right now we worked on and cleaned up the API and probably tomorrow or next day, we're gonna talk about adding it to the cloud and how we published it to Azure. So I'd be, it'd be awesome if you take a look at the API, make sure and the overall application and see if we're straying far from it. Cause ultimately I want this to be a guiding point where people can start with very beginning and go to the very end of have a true end-to-end -end application and not just file new double click type in some code that being said i am all done with today's content uh, feel free to reach out on any social media channel channels that are listed here. Leave a chat. Shoot me an email. Be on tomorrow sometime around 7 p.m. Eastern, 4 p.m. Pacific, uh, maybe later, maybe earlier. Just trying to figure that part out to try and get more people. That being said, have a great day, all.